welcome to this program. My name is Brian Lepak. I'm the chair of the Law Practice Management and Technology section. We welcome you to the program titled Scope of Pri uh, Privacy Privilege in Litigation. Before we start the program, I want to thank Charlie Ballard of Online Security for organizing this program. I would also like to thank the co-sponsors of the, the program, which is the entertainment section, the litigation section, and the family law section of the Beverly Hills Bar Association. Program materials were uh, emailed to you today. They will also be posted in the chat. Uh, MCLE certificates will be sent to attendees via email within 24 hours. Uh, for upcoming uh, MCLE programs, we invite you to visit bhba.org or look for emails that will be sent to you by Beverly Hills Bar Association. If you have any ideas for future MCLE programs, feel free to email the chairs of the various sections of the Beverly Hills Bar Association. If you would be interested in joining any of the executive committees of the various sections, again, reach out to the chairs or reach out to Beverly Hills Bar Association. If you have any questions during the program, feel free to post them either in the Q&A or in the chat and the, the uh, panelists will do their best to answer your questions. And with that, I turn the program over to the panelists. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. Uh, my name is David Chevy. I'm a family law attorney here in West Los Angeles. And uh, I'm gonna take the uh, beginning and then pass it off to Neville Johnson. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank Brian and uh, Neville for uh, allowing me to be a part of this. I've learned a lot uh, preparing Neville. Thank you to the Beverly Hills Bar Association and thank all of you who are spending a little bit of time this afternoon with us. In case I forget to say it at the end, I encourage any of you who have questions afterwards to give me a call or send me an email. So the title of this is the scope of the privacy privilege which is an interesting title because the right of privacy in California, at least as of now, is not really a privilege. There's nothing in Division 8 of the Evidence Code that refers to the right of privacy. And California is pretty clear that courts cannot, or at least are not supposed to create new privileges, unlike federal courts who can. And I say are not supposed to, and we'll get, we'll get to that a little bit at the end. So the right of privacy is nowhere in the evidence code. It's also, at least as far as I've been able to find, nowhere in the United States Constitution. I'm told it's there. I've looked and I can't find it. But it does exist in the California Constitution, right up front. Article 1, Section 1 says, all people are by nature free and independent and have inalienable rights. Among these are enjoying and defending life and liberty, acquiring, possessing, and protecting property, and pursuing and obtaining safety, happiness, and privacy. So what does that tell us? Well, first of all, it refers to all people. People, individuals, are protected by California's constitutional right of privacy, not corporations. Now, there's always an exception in law, and the exception here is that some corporate protection may exist depending on the nexus between the corporation or the artificial entity and the human beings that are part of it and the context in which the controversy arises. So you can make the argument if you need to, and you can look at the Roberts versus Gulf oil case for some guidance. But by and large, we're talking about a constitutional right of privacy for people. The next thing we know is it, it kind of follows from the fact that this is not a privilege. Uh, the right of privacy is not absolute. Instead, it protects the reasonable expectation of privacy against a serious invasion of that right. It's a qualified right to privacy. So what does that mean in practice? What does the reasonable expectation of privacy versus the, you know, the 
protection of a serious invasion of that right, how does that actually play out in the practice of law? Well, it plays out through a balancing test that the court is required to perform. A court must carefully balance the right of privacy versus the public interest in obtaining just results in litigation. And I think that's important. When you think about the privileges that are set forth in the evidence code, our legislature has made determinations that in various areas of the law, physician, patient, uh, uh, psychotherapist, et cetera, they value that privilege more than they value getting to the truth that may be inhibited by the exercise of that privilege. But in the context of a constitutional right of privacy analysis, it is the judge that has to make that determination as to which, how much weight should be afforded each. Uh, Valley Bank of Nevada lays out some of the things that a court has to consider. It's in the materials. Some of those things are the purpose of the uh, information that is being sought, the effect that its disclosures may have on the parties and on the trial, the nature of the privacy objection, and the ability of the court to make an alternate order. In doing this balancing, it's a sliding scale. The, the court has to look at how sensitive is this information when determining how much weight to give the claimed right of privacy. One thing we know is that if a compelling public interest is at stake, discovery will almost always be appropriate. How to define a compelling public interest? I don't have time to go into that in my, eight, in my 20 minutes here, but uh, something to keep in mind when making your argument. If you want to invade a right of privacy, you would always want to argue that a compelling public interest is at stake. So as litigators, we know that burdens are critical and we always need to think who has the burden. Well, in this case, there's somewhat a burden shifting. It starts with the party asserting the privacy interest. That party has to establish that interest and the seriousness of that interest. But once that's done, it shifts to the party seeking discovery to show a compelling public interest, if possible, or if not, simply a need for discovery. And that need needs to be more than a generalized need. It has to be a particularized need for the information that is sought. And it has to be directly relevant to proving the truth of the matter in dispute. So for those of us who, who deal with the uh, Discovery Act all the time, and I, I reckon that's everybody on this webinar, we know that's a very different standard than Code of Civil Procedure 2017.010, which, which only uh, requires a showing of relevance or reasonably calculated to lead to the discovery of admissible evidence. This is a very different statute. Well, it's not a statutory scheme. It's a very different analysis. The other thing that you need to show if you want to obtain information is that the information is not available from other sources or from less intrusive means. So what are these areas of privacy that can be protected? Well, here's some examples of areas of privacy that have already been recognized by the courts. Membership in associations, issues dealing with personal finances, including wills and estate planning documents of a living person, medical records, employment history, personnel records, arrest records, and information regarding sexual relations. This is obviously a non-exhaustive non list. It's just things that have appeared thus far in appellate decisions. Thinking of medical records, let me detour for a second to point out something that I think is interesting. We're dealing here 
uh, with a constitutional right of privacy, of course, not a statutory privilege. So when I think of medical records, what I'm reminded of is those are there are two separate ways if you're seeking to prevent the disclosure of medical information. One is by asserting the privilege, and the second is by asserting a constitutional right of privacy. The privilege is certainly better. It's more absolute. It's not subject to a balancing test. But what if that privilege has been waived? What if you have a Manila type situation where you've invited uh, a spouse into a medical consultation with you and a court finds that that serves as a waiver? Well, you have a second bite at the apple. You have a backup by asserting a right of privacy. Not as strong, but definitely not to be overlooked. So let's say I'm looking to get information that is arguably uh, within the scope of a constitutional right of privacy. What's necessary? Notice, direct notice to the person whose privacy is involved. Sometimes there's a statutory method of notice that's required, the, uh, uh, to, you know, the uh, notice to consumer comes to mind immediately. But uh, other times a court can direct exactly what type of notice is to be appropriate. And a court can even direct a third party holder of information, let's say a bank or a life insurance company to seek the consent to disclose the personal information of its customers. It's important to give that notice to protect from objections down the road. And what do I mean by that? Who can object to the provision of information on the ground that it invades a constitutional right of privacy? A party, a third party, or a party on behalf of a third party? You can do it a variety of ways. You can object. If you choose, you can uh, seek a protective order. But importantly, a lack of a timely objection may not serve as a waiver. There's no definitive law on this, but there is a case, Bowler 201 Cal App 3rd 467, which says we're not sure that the normal waivers that come with discovery objections are going to apply when we're dealing with a constitutional right of privacy. You may have noticed that virtually all of the cases in the materials are writ cases, and that makes sense given the, the fact that once this information got, gets out, it could be a, a rep, irreparable harm. But a lot a lot of law yet to be made on this issue, particularly around the issue of waiver. Um, we do know that there's no waiver to the constitutional right of privacy if you object to discovery on alternate grounds, even if you forget the right of privacy objection. And we know you can object for the first time in response to a motion to compel if you haven't been given prior notice and an opportunity to object. Hence my comment earlier about better practice to give the notice first rather than deal with it down the line in an opposition to a motion. Right of privacy would be one of the uh, few reasons, at least in my view, that it would be justified to instruct a deponent not to answer at a deposition. If you get an order from a judge permitting the disclosure, as the person opposing the disclosure, you have a right to insist that that order be as narrowly drawn as possible. Court orders are to preserve the right of privacy to the extent possible. There is a presumptive right to a protective order limiting financial information. That is true both for parties and for non-parties. 
a common uh, protective order, and I think Neville's going to uh, touch on this in a few minutes when I pass the baton to him, uh, are orders limiting the scope of disclosures, to whom disclosures can be made, lawyers, parties, experts. Uh, but it is permissible under the right circumstances to have a true attorney's eyes only protective order. No disclosure to the client that has been upheld. I want to talk for a few minutes about a California Supreme Court case known as Schnabel, particularly Schnabel 1. This is a key case in California family law regarding the right of privacy, but it goes, its applicability is far beyond the family law context. In Schnabel, the husband owned 30% of the stock in a close corporation, but all of that stock was community property. Now the wife sought a wide range of business records from the corporation and the corporation objected. Uh, the holding, the first of the holdings, was that the wife was entitled to this information. And one of the main reasons the wife was entitled to it is because husband, as a shareholder, was entitled to the information. And pursuant to family code fiduciary duties, what the husband was entitled to, the wife is entitled to. Uh, the point being, many ways, many ways to get around a, a uh, objection based on right of privacy. What's the second holding in Schnabel? Well, the wife also sought various tax returns from the corporation. And the holding was that the implied taxpayer privilege is not absolute. Well, what do you mean, right? I mean, we started out by talking about how in California, unlike in the federal system, courts cannot create non-statutory privileges. Courts have done so for tax returns. And they say, well, true, it's not in the evidence code, but we're not really creating uh, our own privilege because it's based on statutory language and underlying policy. That's from one of the footnotes in Schnabel. And as a result, the court held that even though it's a, even though it's a privilege, even though it's not in the evidence code, it's not a real privilege, the court says, because it's not absolute. What does all that mean? It means that in a case of constitutional right of privacy, which is also not a privilege, which is also not absolute. I would suggest you can look to the law of privilege and analogize to the taxpayer privilege, in quotes, when applicable. It's out there. So what did the court hold? It, the court held that the corporate tax returns must be produced and certain things could be redacted that related to individuals as opposed to the corporation, third-party individuals. But what's the takeaway? The takeaway I think is two. Remember number one from our balancing test, the requesting party bears the burden of demonstrating the particularized need for the information sought that is directly relevant and essential to determining the truth of the matter. The, Schnabel in the Supreme Court in Schnabel referred over and over again to the accountant's declaration, the forensic accountant's declaration that was submitted, very specifically talking about why certain information was necessary to get to the truth of wife's claims in that case. The one area where the Supreme Court did not permit production, dealing with payroll returns, was the area where they criticized the forensic accountant's declaration as being conclusory. It is a very fact-driven analysis. If you want information that is even arguably protected by a constitutional right of privacy, you need to be specific about why you need it to do justice. Finally, from Schnabel and other cases, 
we learn that an in-camera review to assess the, the, the value of the information to the discovering party and weigh that against the harm of disclosure is not mandatory, but it can be an abuse of discretion not to grant it when asked under the right circumstances. The party seeking the in-camera review has the obligation and the burden of proof to show good cause for it. But if good cause is shown, the court needs to do it. Now that doesn't mean the court is required to sift through everything on its own. Uh, the Babcock case, uh, which I believe is in the materials, and if it's not email me, I'll send it to you, talks about how the court can shift the burden of the burden on these in-camera reviews to the party claiming the privacy. And by shifting the burden, what the court says is the party claiming the privacy can submit detailed declarations, obviously under penalty of perjury, explaining to the court what this information is that it's reviewing and why that information should not be produced. Shifting again, the burden to provide very specific details for this very fact intensive inquiry. All right, uh, with that, uh, I will uh, turn over to my colleague, Neville Johnson. Hello everybody, I'm Neville Johnson. I'm, uh, I have a firm called Johnson Johnson. There's eight lawyers here in Beverly Hills. We do uh, entertainment, media, business, class action litigation, libel, and privacy. Um, in fact, I, one of the things I'm known for is I uh, went all the way to the California Supreme Court after a full-on trial on the right of privacy and the use of hidden cameras, and we successfully sued the ABC Television Network for the, on a, on a uh, magazine show that they had, and I helped establish the boundaries of the right of privacy in a journalistic context. So, and privacy is obviously a big issue. In depositions, you should know this, there's only two objections where you can in instruct not to answer. That is uh, attorney-client privilege or privacy. So keep that in mind. The biggest problem I'm, fa I'm facing these days is, is protective order issues. I, every single case, the other side says, you, you, we have to sign a protective order. And then they send, try and send over some horrible document overall, which uh, they want to then negotiate for time immemorial. I've had it with that. And uh, to some degree, the courts have as well. So I know the Superior Court, at least in the uh, complex division, has a form for a, a protective order. I send that over and say, that's what we're going to use. If you don't like it, I'm going down to the court right now. Let's have one of those informal discovery conferences because otherwise you got to set a motion like three months out. Who's got time to do that? So do discovery early and, uh, and, and, and get the protective order signed overall. I want to talk about the use of does. That may occur to you in your practice. It has in mind. It's happening today. Uh, in one of my cases, uh, that's where the plaintiff or the defendant can be a doe. Uh, it's a, the defendant is when you don't know who the doe is, and then you have to subpoena the, the, the Facebook or whomever, Twitter, to get the identity of the person who allegedly was the defamer. And there's a balancing test that, as we've heard about, uh, and by the way, good job, David, and there's a balancing test that, that, that occurs of, you know, is do you, have a, do you have a good shot at winning? You have to sh establish that and uh, to show that you can't get the information any other way. And it's commonly used and uh, particularly in uh, defamation type of cases. You'll see, the use, you'll see it in a plaintiff side when it's uh, got embarrassing information. So we filed one of uh, the client had been given, alleged she'd been given her, herpes by her husband. Um, and it's widely used, uh, these Doe cases, although there's no specific authority. You're supposed to name the person, but there are several cases that say it's okay. And then there's just a lot of cases on appeal where it was a Doe or whomever. You'll see it in sexual assault cases. You'll see it in uh, con contribute, contributing to, uh, for, in the one case was a socialist cause. 
You'll see it in a criminal history case or in a case where someone was saying, my criminal history is not relevant anymore. Uh, and I should I shouldn't have to put it out there now. Um, you'll see it in juveniles, in the case of juveniles. In fact, I was a public defender many years ago, and uh, every case was uh, John H. or the person's first name and an initial. And you see it in healthcare cases. All right, another area that comes up where they're going to say, well, you've got all this confidential information, and, uh, and I'm saying, yeah, and I, uh, but I, you've got information that were direct, directly related to my case. So that these are, you're going to find with email cases and uh, other computer discovery cases. So in the one big, large case I had, what we hired the computer company, the forensic computer analysis to go in and mirror the hard drive of the defendant in this case. And then you, we set up a protocol. We actually had a special master from JAMS. We set up a protocol in which these are the questions or the, the, the phrases, the names, the words that will be used, and then you're going to run that through, that if you claim anything is privileged on the other side, you will, that will then go to the judge to determine whether or not it can be released or not. But don't forget about that um, in this world. The next thing is uh, sub rosa. Now, for, for you people out there in PI land, uh, uh, you know what I'm talking about. There's uh, so many cases involving personal injury where they claim that the person's a grifter or a faker. Uh, uh, they go and they, they film the person lifting weights, or whatever it may be. If ask for it in discovery. You're entitled to it. Ask for it and get it if it's because it may in fact happen and you don't want to be, uh, you know, sidewindered. Um, there was... Uh, a recent case, this is when we're talking about hidden cameras, um, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about the tort of intrusion and what a hidden camera, uh, what, when you are protected from one, but there was a case about three, four years ago where some P employees were changing in their office late at night and the camera was on and the court said that was legal for them to do that because they didn't have an expectation of privacy at that time. All right, another big issue tele is the t taping of the telephone call. Certainly, you can't wiretap anybody. Uh, you guys may have heard of Anthony Pelicano, who spent 14 years in prison for wiretapping people. We had 10 cases involving him. But Penal Code 630 says you can't wiretap anybody. Similarly, you cannot tape somebody on the phone in California unless they give you permission. And... Uh, they changed the law some years ago in which it was, well, you, there was no privacy if you thought you're, it might be repeated. That's not the law anymore. It's do you have an expectation that there is electronic recording going on? If you don't, then it could be a violation of the right of privacy. Also, no unannounced third parties on a phone call. If you're on a phone call with somebody, you got to announce so-and-so is there. Also, no, many states have what are called two-party states. Uh, where, uh, or one party states, we're a two party state in California. One party state says uh, if one person consents, for example, New York or uh, Nevada, that's okay. Well, if you're taping from New York or Nevada or in another case involving Georgia, I don't care if it's one party or not, you cannot tape a California person while they're in California. Um, and you can't use the illegal, the unlawful taping except there is authority that says you can use it to impeach. So I don't know how tough it's going to be at the end of the day. There's a one-year statute of limitations. Also, I've seen it. Whenever you find out that there has been uh, taping that's impermissible, consider a cross action. You know, it has, uh, you can get uh, a minimum of 750 damages. You can get Actual damages, if there are any, you can get emotional distress damages, you can get punitive damages, uh, and you can get attorney's fees. So be careful, be, be aware of that. I want to just say, if you are suing uh, over the right of privacy, that's just the beginning of your privacy being invaded. You are, they are going to look over you as carefully as possible. It's going to be miserable for your clients. And I, I can tell you, in the case of celebrities, they go, what? Uh, and that's a, a major rationale and impediment to 
people who are prominent from uh, suing for invasion of privacy overall. Um, tax returns. Uh, David touched on this. It's not absolute. It can be, and everybody always wants everybody's tax returns, but it can be weighed by disclosure to third parties. He adverted to the case if there's if the if it's a closely held corporation, the spouse is probably going to have to turn over the tax returns, and uh, you're certainly going to have to, usually you're going to turn over the tax returns in child and spousal support proceedings. Another issue is is trade secrets. And that's, uh, we had a trade secret case recently, and that was exactly what uh, David adverted to. It was eyes only for the attorney because it was trade secrets overall. So that's another way to handle it. You know, you can, typically I think what happens is you object and you just don't turn it over. Then they have to sue to move to compel. You have to go through the meet and confer process. If you're unreasonable, you can get hit with attorney's fees. But um, uh, you, in seeking a, in defending a right of privacy, so one of the things that commonly comes up is attorney work product. Excuse me, I'm not letting you know my impressions and thoughts on how this case, uh, you know, because it relates to how I believe this case should be uh, litigated. So. What happens there is that the court has an evidence code 402 hearing uh, to determine preliminary facts. And uh, the court does not necessarily get to see uh, what is claimed to be uh, privileged. Uh, in fact, I, I learned this in st studying for this talk today, there is no crime fraud. The crime fraud exception does not apply to attorney client communication so that if you're telling your client how to commit a crime, they can't get it, except if you're prosecuted by the government as an attorney, they can see it. And secondly, guess what? In a federal case I had, the judge said, you're going to turn over all the attorney-client communications. And it was uh, ruinous for the, for, every, for the defendant and his lawyer. So if you can imagine a settlement conference where there are three parties, the plaintiff, the defendant, and the lawyer who's separately being sued now by the defendant and his insurance company is there for malpractice. Um, a privilege log. In every case that you do discovery, you must be demanding a privilege log from the other side. And they have to turn it over. Um, and if they don't, you need to force them to do it. I mean, so many times you'll see it's just a... Uh, ridiculous claim. And uh, that's how you're going to find out what exactly is being uh, asserted. There's something called the common interest privilege um, or common defense privilege. It's a little bit tricky. It does exist. It exists in the context of if you're talking to the other side because it's part of your determination of how to do strategy in the particular case, then that is considered to be work product overall. But the court could have a hearing, I suppose, or it could, to determine whether or not this was legitimate or, legitimate or not. One of the things that, you know, they're going to want to know, for example, is who are your witnesses and what are they going to say? Well, you may be required to turn over who the, the, wit who the witnesses are that you know, but you don't have to tell them what they're going to say. That brings us to witness statements. In so many cases, you're gonna get a witness statement from a party or from a third party, and that's yours. And that's part of how you're gonna mount your defense. Unless there's a compelling reason, the other side is not gonna be entitled to see that witness statement if you prepared it. If the witness prepared it, you gotta turn it over. Um, so that's why in some cases you may want to have your private investigator do the interviews. You know, we, we face that sometimes where we just say, well, I don't want to be a party of this case. I don't, I don't have to be questioned uh, about who said what. So we'll have a private investigator ask the questions of, of the, of the prospective witness. And there is actually, 
Business and Professions Code 7539 in parentheses A. Private investigators are prohibited by law from disclosing information developed in the course of an investigation. So on a Paul Drake, Perry Mason level, you might want to consider that down the line that your PI, if he doesn't write it down, he's certainly not going to have a witness statement. If he does write it down, it's probably going to be work product. He's a consultant for you. You're not going to call him on the stand. Um, in the work product context, they look to see whether it's derivative or non-derivative. Are the attorney's evaluations of fact or law? Work that relates to the mental impressions are protected, uh, just as opinions are protected. And uh, where the attorney may have interviewed all the witnesses, there's authority that says, you know, you can expect you're going to have to turn over those statements. Um, and so it's improper to ask in an interrogatory, what is so-and-so going to say? They don't, get, they don't have a right to know. That's part of how we do this. Um, consultants' reports are protected. So we all have expert witnesses all the time, and, and we should be calling them consultants until we decide to turn the switch on and hire them overall. It's protected as confidential up to that point. But once you identify them, everything you've ever communicated to that expert witness is uh, has to be divulged to the other side. So be aware of that. What happened in, in, a, in a situation where there's a work product is, is, is claimed, um, if the attorney is not available, the attorney, if the attorney has the right to, right to assert it, they, then the, uh, uh, a client can assert it. And a, a note to, to you all, I've seen this in uh, legal mal cases. The work product of an attorney in a legal mal case is not protected. Uh, from disclosure to the client if he's suing or even if he's not suing. It's like, give me the file. I'm entitled to everything that you did. That you did. So be, be careful of what you put down. Like, don't write things like, you know, I think this client's a total loser and I'm just doing this for the money. Don't do that. Um, <clears throat> okay, so I'm not sure I've got a lot more to say about that, except that you got to be vigilant from the deposition on to every aspect of it, it is the primary methodology by which uh, defense and uh, plaintiff lawyers too use to send uh, keep keep to keep the lawyer the other side outside the walls of the information. We're seeking information at the end of the day, um, and I also I mean I can't tell you how many times it's been valuable for me to get information that I had a subpoena and. And, and maybe move to compel uh, that were on uh, computers because um, that's exactly what happened in one case. I got the hard drive of a, uh, or the emails of a, somebody from a, uh, and his notes from a previous job. And it turned out he'd stolen a TV show and said, I'm going to basically steal the TV show. And it was the end of the line for him and the end of the case. So with that, uh, do you have anything else to add, David, or I'll just start going to the questions. Uh, I, I'll, talk briefly uh, about how to seal a file, which is just uh, the last page of the materials. Uh, the, the point of this was really just to make sure that everybody has all the information in one spot. Uh, NBC subsidiary is, is the kind of the main case that talks about the elements and the California rule of court lays out exactly what needs to be done. 2.550 talks about the requirements to seal a file. Overriding interest that overcomes the right of public access. A substantial probability that the overriding interest will be prejudiced if the record is not sealed. The narrowly tailored request to seal the file. Not everything, maybe just a declaration, maybe just an exhibit to a declaration, and no less restrictive means exist to achieve the overriding interest. Uh, 2.551 of the California Rules of Court 
uh, sets forth the procedures to getting uh, this sort of order. Can a private judge make such an order? He cannot. Can a referee make such an order? She cannot. Uh, restrictions only to judges who are currently sitting on the bench to make sure that, uh, or I think to, to try and make sure that the rules of sealing are strictly complied with. Uh, and that is it, uh, Neville. Do you I, want have to some more, I have some more. So uh, uh, going back on that, uh, uh, the NBC case that you were talking about, that involved Lynn Eastwood's former girlfriend who had brought a claim saying, your settlement agreement with me previously that I was going to have a first look deal on some movies was bull. And uh, she was suing for violation of, of that, the good faith and fair dealing. And they settled the case. And then the judge sealed it. And uh, the Supreme Court of California said, wait a minute, you may have settled the case, but this is an important issue. We don't want cases sealed. And I can tell you from experience, both in federal and state court, almost every case I've got has got their sealing and they're declaring every, every deposition confidential overall. It's, it's, it's very upsetting. Um, but uh, that's kind of what's happening right now, and particularly when it comes to financial information, how much profits were made on a TV show, for example, or what the talent was going to get. Um, but that's, it's commonly done. Let me also just mention from the plane of side, because we're in privacy, the two big areas where there are torts. Tort number one is intrusion. That's when the defendant has intruded on the plane of solitude and it's offensive to a reasonable person. Um, so uh, we had a case uh, uh, involving, uh, well, I can say this public was Richard Simmons. They put a tracker on his car uh, to determine whether or not he was going to the hospital. It was very wrong. And of course that was a typical intrusion case. There was a recent case uh, however, this is about a month or two old where some guy up in Sacramento uh, was doing it with a couple of women who were prostitutes and he filmed it and somehow <laughs> and then he sued for violation of the right of privacy. And the court said, no, nah, not on this kind of a situation here. Uh, but how about Kathy Griffin? You know, the comedian Kathy Griffin, this relates to a question that was just asked. Can you take your front yard? Yes. That's exactly the case. Kathy Griffin had the neighbor from hell next door and uh, they were loud and profane. And she uh, was taping from her house and also a little bit of the backyard of the other person that she could see from her porch. And they sued for uh, intrusion overall. And the court said, if you are screaming expletives at 10 o'clock at night, it's okay for your neighbor to tape that. Um, so that's another example right there. Another case that came down recently was a woman who uh, was a published decision. It was on a reality show uh, uh, and uh, they showed her changing uh, and a little bit of her breasts apparently or partially clothed. And uh, she said, I gave you permission for the reality show. I didn't give you permission for this. You exceeded the boundaries. Court agreed with her and said, uh, gave her the green light to go with that. The next other area of uh, torts in privacy is called the publication of private facts. That's the public disclosure of private facts offensive and objectionable to a reasonable person, which is not of legitimate public concern. So there's been a lot of cases over the years. It's a somewhat tricky area. The law changed 20 years ago in which uh, there used to be the Reader's Digest case, some of you may have read in law school, in which the woman uh, had been a uh, 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 prostitute, I guess, I'm trying to find a better word, and, uh, and had cleaned up her act. And the Reader's Digest wrote about it, and she said, excuse me, you, I, I mean, I clean up my act, I have a right to lead a good life. And they said, and, the, and, and that was the law until about 10, 20 years ago, Anything that's ever a public record stays public. Once it's out there, it's out there. The highest levels of private facts are involved sexuality and medical. 
nobody has a right to know what your sexual orientation is. So one of the big cases uh, goes back to a somebody who was a, at a junior college and was like student body vice president or something, and they outed outed the person as being a transsexual. The court said that's not that's not important in, in life. You don't. She has a right. On the other hand. Squeaky Fromm, one of the Manson girls, tried to shoot Gerald Ford in San Francisco and was uh, stopped by a couple of uh, gay uh, men, and they sued. And the court said, well, it was, it's for some reason they found that that was somehow relevant. Keep in mind, in the European, elect, the European economic community, there is a right of privacy, notwithstanding the information that's been public. And it went to the highest court in. Uh, the European Economic uh, Community in Strasbourg, I believe. And, uh, and there a lawyer had said, yeah, I declared bankruptcy 15 years ago in Spain. It doesn't matter now anymore. And the court said, you're right. And now tens, hundreds of thousands of people have been able to expunge that information from Google. But the expungement doesn't apply to America. I just had somebody contact me, uh, uh, some, a very powerful entity person and i said i'm sorry you can sue, you can you can sue for this in the, in england and in uh, this eastern european country but, uh, uh, but there's no guarantee that it's not going to be taken down here and uh, and and i found also that taking down information you get no if it's an invasion of privacy you get no help from 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 twitter facebook uh, at all. And uh, uh, they will take something down if you have a court judgment, if you have an order that says that. But ordinarily, they, they say, we're too busy to do this. Okay. We got 12 minutes left. I have a question for you. This is Brian Lee Pack. How about you guys talk about a privilege log and, and your tips with regard to a privilege log? Because oftentimes when you're putting together that privilege log, some of what you say seems to disclose what you don't want to say, such as when you spoke to somebody. Any tips on how we should put together a privilege log? <sighs> yeah, don't try not to disclose it. Try and make them force it. Or I would tell the court then, look, this will tip my hand in an unfair way if I'm required to do that. You know, one of the issues I think that's a wobbler, so, so to speak, is when did you first call the attorney and hire him? When did he become your attorney? Oh, do you had conversations before he became your attorney? Well, when, were, when did that happen? And uh, were you talking about his being your attorney at that point? I mean, almost always they're going to say, don't tell them. You don't, they don't get to know anything at all. But until somebody, until you have the understanding that you're actually my attorney or I'm you know, and, and I'm seeking you to be my attorney, and the attorney knows that, it's a good argument that they have to disclose uh, what it was that was talked about. Is it better not to put a log out and make the other side force you to get a log? Even though you're taking a risk, you might get sanctioned for that? I'm not going to tell you or anybody to violate the rules of discovery. No, you oh, should be careful. You know, what I would say is that at least in the family law context, the, the disclosure of a privilege log as is now required by the Discovery Act is very commonly uh, disregarded. So, uh, and I, I can't speak to the civil litigation side of things, but in family law, if you're starting out by producing a privilege log uh, together with your discovery responses, I think you're ahead of the game. And I think you can fulfill the requirements of the Discovery Act by uh, and not disclose anything that you don't want to disclose. And then I, I agree with Neville, make them make them make them take you to court. But I think if you started out with the log, you're way ahead of the game. Yeah, unless it's absurd, unless, they, unless uh, it's absurd, give, give them what they want. So another Always area, caveat. don't do anything absurd. Maybe we can talk about private judges. A lot of people like to use private judges thinking they're going to keep things uh, out of the public eye. And maybe you guys can discuss the limitations of what's really going on in using a private judge versus the regular assigned court judge. Well, you had, uh, David, at the end of your uh, uh, summary here, rule of court, 
private can private judges order sealing? No. Uh, can a, can a, can a, well can a temporary judge do it? Can a referee do it? No, they can't do it. You, well, of course, that's the reason you go to um, private judges overall is uh, because the typically the defendant wants privacy, but sometimes the plaintiff might as well. I can tell you that uh, in the entertainment industry, uh, every single studio requires jams. And there's a backlash against that because the claim is uh, by some plaintiff lawyers that, uh, you know, if all they're getting all the business, um, they're going to be favoring, uh, at least subliminally, uh, the uh, arbitrator overall. But uh, yeah, I mean, uh, uh, that's another thing, too. This is very important if you aren't aware of this. Unless your agreement for arbitration says you can conduct discovery, you don't get to do third party discovery at all. That's a case that came down about a year ago in Sacramento, a court of appeal. So that's a practice tip to be very mindful of if you're going to do it. You know, we're a little bit off the topic, but I, I don't like this uh, arbitration at all. If it's if it's a hundred thousand dollar case, I'm going to spend thirty forty thousand dollars with the arbitrator probably, or perhaps because they're not he or she they're not inexpensive overall. So you better be really mindful of that. And that's another thing that I tell people is I put in attorneys fees clauses for the prevailing party because I'm betting my client's going to be on the right, and that may be the only reason why a, a contingency lawyer may take the case is because there is the possibility of getting attorneys fees. So well, we don't. You know, we don't do a whole lot of arbitration in family law. It happens sometimes, but it's it's much more common to have the appointment of a temporary judge. And, you know, the, the rules are, are fairly clear about what needs to be filed publicly. And I, I think in my experience, they're sometimes more often honored in the breach than of the observance. Uh, but... And perhaps that's one of the reasons for the concurring opinion in that Pidge Lee case, where one of the uh, appellate court uh, justices said we shouldn't have private judging. Um, I think that their, their, their benefits radically outweigh any objections, though. Well, in my experience, sometimes what people can do is you have a relationship with that judge. And you can meet with the judge ahead of time and set the scope of things, such as what you're briefing, or maybe you're not going to brief and you're just going to argue a case so that there isn't a public record of a brief that you have to file. Maybe the judge can make a decision, that, be, but instead of writing up an opinion, he lets the parties sign a stipulation that's similar to what they're doing, but have an agreement that it's not going to get filed unless there's a breach of the agreement as another way of protecting the privacy so that using a private mediator you're not, you're not violating the rules, but you may be kind of skirting them in order to maintain some effort of privilege, uh, privacy. I think that's, that's all accurate, Brian. And, and one of the things that we do in family law as well is we'll enter a stipulation or even a judgment that really says little more than there is a private agreement that has been reached and will not be filed uh, unless there's a need for enforcement. So uh, a lot of ways to preserve parties' privacies if both parties are agreeable to doing so. Yeah, let, me mention, let me mention about that is the uh, commonly we see, uh, I want to see that settlement agreement you did with so-and-so that who happened to be in this case before that. Do I get to see that or not? And the court's going to do the usual balancing test and say, yeah, but that's what happens with a third party uh, what, typically they say, well, I'm sorry, I can't turn it over. Do you have a confidentiality agreement? Well, you don't get to decide that. The court gets to decide that. I think ordinarily it ought to be turned over unless there's some compelling reason. Since this is a law practice management uh, seminar, maybe one of the things we could talk about is what happens when your law firm gets hit with a subpoena seeking information about what if one of your clients, what's a, maybe a good practice in, in how to handle that subpoena? Well, well uh, uh, we haven't had that experience other than a request for information regarding uh, bills. So uh, I'm going to, having not given that any thought, I'll, I'll defer to now. Well, I've had it a few times, but it basically what they were seeking were deposition transcripts, which I don't have a problem turning over. I, I guess that's true. We have had that as well. 
But and it, that might may have required my having to give notice to the other side of, hey, they're seeking this. Do you want to do something about it and try and prevent it? Yeah, I think the first thing you do is immediately contact your client and make sure you've got evidence that you've contacted your client to say, what do you want us to do? Because we have an obligation to disclose it unless you say otherwise, although you have to be careful about that because you may have to object some privilege if you know it exists for that client. So I, but the very first tip is to start by contacting your client and see if you can get the client to give you some instruction as to what they want to do so that when you do take action, you can say, yeah, well, you told me to do it and that's why I did it. Yes. Even if they're no longer your client, you have the right to assert the objection on their behalf. And as Brian points out, you may have the obligation to do so as well. Well, uh, thanks, everybody, for listening in. I appreciate the opportunity and uh, great working with you, David. And Likewise. Likewise. Thank you to everybody involved, including the especially the attendees. You can go back to your private lives. <laughs> thank you for attending, everybody. All right. Thank you all. Thank you.